Spukochać przyszła mnie współnienawidzić. To jest mi natura, aby mówić w kierunku, nie w had. To jest moja natura, aby zjednoczyć się w amor. To jest moja natura, aby unir się w amor i nie w odwiedzie. To jest moja natura, aby zjednoczyć się w amor, nie w hate. on Oedipus. I cannot imagine any grief you and I have not gone through, and now have they told you of the new decree of our King Creon? I've heard nothing. I know that two sisters lost two brothers, a double death in a single hour, and I know that the arch of army fled in the night, but beyond there is nothing. Not so. And that is why I wanted you to come out here with me. There is something we must do. Why do you speak so strangely? Listen, Ismini. Creon buried our brother Eteocles with military honors, gave him a soldier's funeral, and it was right that he should. But Polynices, who fought as bravely and died as miserably, they say that Creon has sworn no one shall bury him, no one mourn for him. But this body must lie in the fields, a sweet treasure for carry on birds to find as they search for food. That is what they say, and our good crayon is coming here to announce it publicly, and the penalty? Stoning to death in the public square. There it is. Now you can prove what you are a true sister or a traitor to your family. Antigone, you are mad. What could I possibly do? You must decide whether you will help me or not. I don't understand you. Help you in what? Ismini, I am going to bury him. Will you come? <laughs> bury him? You just said the new love for He is my brother, and he is your brother too. But think of the danger. Think what Creon will do. Creon is not enough to stand in my way. Sister. Oedipus died. Everyone hated him for his own search brought to life. His eyes ripped out by his own hand. And Neocastle died. <laughs> his mother and wife at once. She twisted the cords, a stronger of life, and our two brothers died, each killed by the other sword. And now we are left. But don't think of me. Think how much more terrible than this our own death will be if we should go against Creon and do what he has forbidden. <sighs> we are only women. We cannot fight with men, Antigone. <sighs> the law is strong. We must give in the law in this and in wars. I beg the dead to forgive me. But I'm helpless. We must yield to those in authority, and I think it is dangerous business to be always meddling. That is what you think. I should not want you, even if you asked to come. You have made your choice. You can be what you want to be, but I will bury him. And if I must die, I say that this crime is holy. I shall lie down with him in death, and I shall be as dear to him as he to me. It is the dead, not the living, who make the longest demands. We die forever. 
You may do as you like, since apparently the laws of the gods mean nothing to you. They mean a great deal to me! I just don't have the strength to break the laws that were made for the public good. That must be your excuse, I suppose. But as for me, I will bury the brother I love. I am so afraid for you, Antigone. You need not be. You have yourself to consider after all. But no one must hear this. You must tell no one. I'll keep it a secret. Oh, I'll tell it. Tell everyone. Think how they'll hate you when it all comes out. If they learn that you knew about it all the time. So fiery. You should be cold with fear. Perhaps. But I am doing only what I must. But can you do it? I say that you cannot. Very well. When my strength gives out, I shall do no more. Impossible things should not be dried at all! No way, Ismini! I shall be hating you soon, and the dead will too, for your words are hateful. Leave me my foolish plan. I am not afraid of the danger. If it means death, it will not be the worst of deaths. Death without honor. Go then, if you feel like you must. You are unwise, but a good friend indeed to those who love you. of the sun, lying level east to west, touches with glory Thebes of the seven gates, open, unlidded eye of golden day. Oh, marching light, across the eddying rushes of Durst's stream, striking the white shields of the enemy, thrown headlong backward from the blaze of morning. Polynikis, their commander, roused them with windy phrases. He, the wild eagle, screaming insults above our land. His, His wings, wings their shields, shields of snow. His, His crest, crest their, their marshaled helms. Against our seven gates in a yawning ring, the Finnish spears came onward at the night. But before his jaws were sated with our blood, or pine fire took the garland of our towers, he, he was, was thrown back. back. And, and as he turned, great thieves, no tender victim for his noisy power, rose like a dragon behind him, shouting war! For God hates utterly the bray of bragging tongues. And when he beheld their smiling, their swagger of golden helms, the, the frown, frown of his thunder blasted their first man from our walls. We heard his shout of triumph high in the air and turned to his scream. Far out, in a flaming arc, he fell with his windy torch, and the earth struck him. And others, storming in fury, no less than his, found shock of death in the dusty joy of battle. Seven captains at seven gates yielded their clanging arms to the god that bends the battle line and, and breaks, breaks it. it. These two, only brothers in blood, face to face in matchless rage, mirroring each the other's death, clashed in long combat. But, but now, in a beautiful, beautiful morning of victory, let thieves of the many chariots sing for joy. With hearts for dancing, we'll take leave of war. Our temple shall be sweet with hymns of praise, and, and the long night shall echo with our chorus. But now, at last, last our, our new, new king, king is coming. coming. Crown of Thebes, many years to come. In this auspicious dawn of his reign, what are the new complexities that shifting faith has woven for him? What is his counsel? Why has he summoned the old man to hear? Gentlemen, I have the honor to inform you that our ship of state, which recent events have threatened to destroy, has safely come to harbor at last, guided by the merciful wisdom of heaven. I have summoned you here because I know that I can depend upon you. Your loyalty to King Laius was absolute. 
You've never recitated in your duty to our late ruler, Oedipus, and when Oedipus died, your loyalty was transferred to his children. Unfortunately, as we know, his two sons, the brother Ateocles and Polynikes, have killed each other in battle, and I, as the next in blood, have succeeded to the full power of the throne. I am aware, of course, that no ruler can expect complete loyalty until he has been tested in office. Nevertheless, I say to you from the very outset that I have nothing but contempt for the kind of governor who is afraid, for whatever reason, to follow the course he knows is best for state. And as for the man who sets his private friendships above the public welfare, I have no use for him either. I call God to witness that if I ever saw my country headed for ruin, I shall not be afraid to speak out plainly. And I need hardly remind you that I would never take sides with an enemy of the people. No one values friendship more than I, but we must remember that friendship made at the risk of wrecking our ships are no friends at all. These are my principles, at any rate. And that is why I made the following decision concerning the sons of Oedipus. Aetiocles! who died like a man should die, fighting for his country, he is to be buried with full military honors, with all of the ceremonies that are used when the greatest heroes die. But Polynikis, who broke his exile to come back with fire and sword against the shrines of his father's gods, whose one idea was to spill the blood of his own blood and sell his people into slavery. Polynikis, I say, is to have no burial. No man is to touch him, to say the least prayer for him. He shall be laid out in the plain, unburied, and the birds and the scavenging dogs can do with him whatever they like. This is my will, and you can see the wisdom behind it. For as long as I am king, no traitor shall be honored with a loyal man. But if he shows by word and deed that he is on the side, of the state. He shall have my respect while he lives and my reverence when he is dead. If that is your will, Creon, son of Menachaeus, then it is your right to enforce it. We are yours. That is my will. Take care that you do your part. <laughs> we are old men, Creon. Let the younger ones carry it down. That is not what I meant. The sentries have been appointed. Then what is it that you would have us do? You will give no support to whomever breaks the law. Only a crazy man is in love with death. And death it is. Yet money talks. And the wisest of men have been often found with a few coins too many. I'll not say that I'm out of breath from running the king, because every time that I stop to think what I have to tell you, I felt like going back. And all the time in my head, a voice kept saying, you fool, don't you know that you're walking straight into trouble? And then another voice, yes, but if somebody gets the news to Creon first, then that will be even worse than that for you. But good sense won out. I hope it was good sense. <laughs> But here I am with a story that makes no sense at all, but I'll tell it anyhow, because, as they say, what's going to happen is going to happen. Come, come, out with it. What have you to say? I did not do it. I did not see who did it, so it wouldn't be fair for you to punish me for something that I have not done. A comprehensive defense, perhaps more useful if you told me its purpose. Come, out with it. A dreadful thing. 
I don't know how to end it! Well, then, the dead man, Paulini Kiss. Someone out there, new dust on the slimy flesh. Someone has given a burial that way and gone. And the, the man who dare I do swear this? swear I do not know. You must believe me. Listen, the ground was dry. Not a sign of digging, not a wheel truck in the field, no trace of anyone. It was when they released us this morning that the corporal pointed to it. There it was, the strangest. Look, the body just mounded over with light dust to see, not buried really, but as if they'd covered it, just enough for the ghost's peace. And no sign of dogs or wild animals that have been there. And then what a scene there was. Every man of us accusing the other. We all proved that we could not have done it. We all proved that we really could have not done it. We were ready to take hot irons in our hands, walk through fire. Swear by all the gods, it was not I! I swear, I do not know, but it was not I! Then, when this came to nothing, some one of us said something that silenced us all and made us stare down to the ground. You had to be told the news and someone had to do it. We threw the dice and the bad luck fell on me. So, here I am. Not happier to be here than you are to have me. No one likes the man who brings bad news. I have been wondering, King. Can it be that the gods have done this? The king of the gods! That is blasphemy! The gods would favor a corpse. Why? What has he done for them? Try to loot their temples, burn their father images, yes, and the whole state and its laws with it. Is it your senile opinion that gods would favor bad men? <coughs> A pious thought. No. No, from the very beginning there have been those whispering together, stiff-necked anarchists putting their heads together, scheming against me in alleys. And now they've bribed my own guard to do this thing. Find that man and bring him to me, or your death will be the least of your problem. I will string you up alive, and there are certain ways to make sure you meet your employer before your time. And the process may teach you a lesson you seem to have forgotten. The dearest prophet is often time all too dear. That depends on the source. Do you understand me? A prophet one is very often a misfortune. King, may I speak? Your very voice distresses me. Are you sure it is my voice and not your conscience? By God, he wants to analyze no, me. No, no, it is not what I say, but what has been done that hurts you. You talk too much. Maybe, but I have done nothing. Sold yourself for some silver, that's all you've done. Oh. How dreadful it is when the good judge judges wrong. Your fingers of speech may entertain you now, but unless you bring me that man, they will serve a very little profit for you in the end. Bring me the man. I'd like nothing more than bringing him the man, but bringing him or not, you have seen the last of me here. At any rate, I am safe. Numberless are the world's wonders. But none more wonderful than that. The storm gray sea yields to his prows. The huge crests bear him high. Earth, holy and inexhaustible, is graven with shining pharaohs when his plows has gone year after year. The timeless labor of stallions. The light-boned birds and beasts that cling to cover. The live fish lighting their reaches of dim water are taken, tamed in the net of his mind. The lion on the hill, the wild horse windy mane resigned to him, and the blonde yoke has broken the 
sultry shoulders of the mountain bull. Words also, and thought as rapid as air, he fashions to his good use. Statecraft is his. And his, the skill that deflects the arrows of snow, the spears of wind terrain. From every wind, he has made himself secure. From all but one. In the late wind of death, he cannot stand. O oh, oh, clear intelligence, force beyond all measure. O oh, fate of man, working both good and evil. When the laws are kept, how, how proudly the city stands. When the laws are broken. Washed off the city then. then. Never may the anarchic man find the rest at the my hearth. Never, Never may it be, be said that, that my thoughts are his thoughts. But what is this? Surely this captive woman is the princess Antigone. Why should she be taken? Here is the one who did it. We cut her in the very act of digging him. Where is Creon? Just coming from the house. What has happened? Why have you come back so soon? Oh, king! A man should never be too sure of anything. I would have sworn that you would never see me here again. Your anger frightened me so, and the things you threatened me with. But how could I have known then that I would have been able to solve the case so soon? No less throwing this time. I was only too glad to be here. Here, this is the woman. She is the guilty one. Question her. Take her then. Judge her as you will. I, I am through with the whole thing and glad of it. But this is Antigone! Why have you brought her here? She is the one who did it, I tell you. Is that the truth? I saw her with my own eyes. Can I see more? The details come. Tell me quickly. It was like this. After those terrible threats of yours, King, we went back and, and brushed the dust away from the body. The flesh was soft by now and stinking. So we sat on a hill windward and keep guard. No napping happened until the white round sun whirled in the center of the blue sky over us. The sky went out, and then suddenly a storm of, of dust roared up from the earth. And then the plane vanished with all its trees and the stinging dart. We, we, we closed our eyes and enjoyed it. And then we looked, and there was Antigone. I have seen a mother bird come back to a stripped nest. Heard her crying, barely a broken note or two for the young one stolen. It was just so when this girl found the bare corpse and all her love's work wasted, she cried and wept on heaven to damn the hands that had done this thing. And then we ran and took her at once. She was not afraid. Not even when we charged the world she had done. She denied nothing, and that was a comfort to me and some uneasiness. For it is a good thing to escape from death, but it is no great pleasure to bring death to a friend. Yet I always say there is nothing so comfortable in your own safe skin. And you, Antigone, you with your head hanging. Do you confess this thing? I do. I deny nothing. You may go. Go! Tell me and tell me briefly, have you heard the proclamation that I made regarding this matter? It was public. Could I help hearing it? And yet you dare defy the law. I dared. It was not God's proclamation. That final justice that rules the world below makes no such laws. Your edict, King, was strong. But all your strength is weakness itself against the immortal, unrecorded laws of God. They are not merely now. They were and shall be operative forever beyond man utterly. 
I knew I must die. Even without your decree, I am only mortal. And if I must die now, before it is my time to die, surely this is no hardship. Can anyone living as I live with evil all about me think death less than a friend? This death of mine is of no importance, but if I had left my brother lying in death unburied, then I should have suffered. Now I do not. You laugh at me. <laughs> ah, Crayon. Think me a fool if you like, but it may well be that a fool convicts me of folly. Like father, like daughter, both headstrong, death to reason. She still has not learned how to yield. She has much to learn. The inflexible heart breaks first. The toughest iron cracks first. The wildest horses bend their neck at the pull of the smallest curve. Pride in a slave. This girl is guilty of a double insolence, breaking the given law and boasting of it. Who is the man here, she or I, if I allow this crime to go unpunished? Sister's child, or more than sister's child, or closer, yet in blood she and her sister win bitter death for this. Go arrest as me, I accuse her equally. You will find her sniffling in the house over there. Her mind is a traitor. Thoughts kept in the dark cry for light, and the garden brain shudders. But now, much worse than this is the brazen boasting of bare-faced Danny. Oh, okay. Crayon, what more do you want than my death? Nothing. Your death gives me everything. Then I beg you, kill me. This talking is a great weariness. Your words are distasteful to me, as I am sure mine seems so to you. And yet, they should not seem so. I should have praise and honor for what I have done. All these men here would praise me, were their lips not frozen shut with fear of you. Ah, the good fortune of kings, license to say and do whatever they please. You are alone here with that opinion. No, they are with me, but they keep their tongues in leash. Maybe, but you're guilty and they are not. There is no guilt in reverence for the dead. But to Diocles, was he not your brother too? My brother too. And you insult his memory. The dead man would not say that I insult it. But he would, because you honor a traitor as much as his he. His own brother, traitor or not, and equal in blood. He made war to his country, and Diocles defended it. Nevertheless, there are honors due all the dead. Not the same for the just as for the wicked. Oh, Crayon. Crayon! Which of us is to say what the gods hold wicked? An enemy is an enemy, even dead. It is my nature to join in love, not hate. Don't join them, then! If you must have your love, go find it in hell. But see, Ismidi comes. Those tears are sisterly. The cloud that shadows her eyes rains down gentle sorrow. You too, is many snake in my ordered house, sucking my blood stealthily. And all along I did not know that these two girls were aiming at my throne. Is many. Tell me, do you confess your share in this crime or deny it? Answer me! Yes. If she will let me say so, I am guilty. No, Ismini, you have no right to say so. You would not help me, and I will not have you help me. But now I know what you meant, and I'm here to join you, to take my share of punishment. The dead man and the gods who rule the dead know whose act this was. Words are not friends. 
Antigone, refuse me, Antigone. <sighs> Why? I want to die with you. I do have a duty that I must discharge to the dead. You shall not lessen my death by sharing it. Why do a careful life when you're dead? That's Crayon. You're always hanging on his opinions. <laughs> you are laughing at me. Why, Antigone? It's a joyless laughter, Ismene. But can I do nothing? Yes, save yourself. I shall not envy you. There are those who will praise you. I shall have honor too. But we are equally guilty. No more, Ismini. You are alive, but I belong to death. Gentlemen, I beg you to observe these two girls. One of them just lost her mind. The other one, it seems, never had a mind at all. Grief teaches the steadiest minds to waver, King. Yours certainly did. When you took killed with the guilty. But how can I go on living without her? You are. She is already dead. But your own son's bride. There are enough places for him to push his plow. I do not want any wicked woman for my son. Hemon, how does your father wrong? Enough with this childish talk of marriage. Do, do you really intend to steal these girls from your son? No. Death will do that for me. Then she must die? You dazzle me. But enough of this! Take them away and guard them well! For they are but women. But even brave men run when they see death approaching. is the man who has never tasted God's vengeance. Where once the anger is struck, that house is shaken forever. Damnation, Damnation rises beyond each, each child like, like a, a wave, wave cresting out, out of the black, black northeast. northeast. When the long darkness under sea roars up and bursts, drumming death upon the wind-whipped sand, I have seen this gathering sorrow from time long past loom upon Oedipus's children. Generation from, from generation, generation takes the compulsive rage of the enemy god. So lately the last flower of Oedipus' line drank the sunlight. But now a passionate word and a handful of dust have closed up all its beauty. What mortal arrogance transcends the wrath of Zeus? Sleep? Cannot lull him. Nor the effortless long months of the timeless gods. But he is young forever. And his house is the shining day of high Olympus. All, all that, that is, is and shall be, and, and all the past is his. No pride on earth is free of the curse of heaven. The strange dreams of men may bring them ghosts of joy. But as they drowse, the waking embers burn them. Or they walk with fixed eyes and as blind men walk. But the ancient wisdom speaks for our own time. Fate, Fate works most for woe, with, with folly's fairest show. Man's little pleasure is the, the spring of sorrow. But here is Haman, king, the last of your sons. Is it grief for Antigone that brings him here, and bitterness at being robbed of his bride? We shall soon see, and no need for diviners. Son, you have heard my final proclamation regarding that girl. Have you come here with hatred in your heart, or with love and deference, whatever I do? I am your son, father. You are my guide. You make things clear for me, and I obey you. No marriage means more to me than your continuous wisdom. Good! That is the way to behave. 
subordinate everything, my son, to your father's will. That is what a man prays for, that he should have sons attentive and dutiful in his house, each one honoring his father's friends and hating his father's enemies. But if his sons fail him, if they turn out unprofitably, what has he father but swapple for himself an amusement for the malicious? So, you are right in not losing your head over a woman. Your pleasure would soon grow cold with her, and then you'll be left with a hellcat in your house and elsewhere. <laughs> Let her find her husband in hell. Of all the people in the city, she's the only one who has had contempt for my law and broken it. Do you want me to show myself weak before the people? Or to break my sworn word? No, and I will not. The woman dies. I suppose she'll plead family ties. Well, let her. If I allow my own family to rebel, how shall I earn the world's obedience? Show me the man who can keep his family at hand, and he is fit for command. I will have no dealings with an enemy of the people. Critics of the government. Whenever a man is chosen to govern, he should be obeyed. Must be obeyed in all things, great and small, just and unjust. Oh, one man, the man who knows how to obey, and that man only knows how to give commands when the time comes. You can depend upon him, no matter how fast the spear may come. He's a good soldier. He'll stick it out. Anarchy. Anarchy. Show me a greater evil. That is why cities stumble and the great houses rain down. That is what scatters armies. No, no. Good lives are made so by discipline. And then... We keep the laws and the lawmakers, and no woman shall seduce us. If we must lose, let us lose to a man, at least. Is a woman stronger than we? Unless time has rusted my wits, what you say, king, is said with point and dignity. Father, Reason is God's crowning gift to man, and you are right to ward me against losing mine. I cannot say. I hope that I shall never want to say that you have reasoned badly. Yet, there are other people who can reason too, and their opinions might be helpful. You are not in a position to know everything that people say or do, or what they feel. Your temper terrifies them. They will tell you only what you like to hear, but I, at any rate, can listen. And I have heard them muttering and whispering in the dark about this girl. They say no woman has ever so unreasonably died so shameful a death for such a generous act. She covered her brother's body. Is this indecent? She kept him from dogs and vultures. Is this a crime? Dead! She should have all the honors that we can give her. This is the way they talk out there in the city. You must believe me. Nothing can be closer to me than your happiness. What can be closer? Must not any son value his father's fortune as his father does his? I beg you, do not be unchangeable. Do not believe that you alone can be right. A man who thinks that? A man who believes that only he has the power to reason correctly, the gift to speak, to soul. A man like that, when you know him, he turns out empty. It is no reason never to yield to reason. In flood times, you can see how some trees bend. And because they bend, even their twigs are safe. While stubborn trees are torn up, roots and all. And the same thing happens in sailing. Make your sheets fast, never slacken, and there you go, head over heels and under. And there is your voyage. Do not be angry. Make yourself be moved. I know I am young, but let me say this. I admit 
that men should be right by instinct. But since we are all too likely to go astray, the reasonable thing would be to learn from those who can teach. You would do well to listen to him, King, if what he says is sensible. And you, Haman, must listen to your father. Both speak well. You think it right for a man of my years and experience to be schooled by a boy? It is not right if I am wrong, but if I am young and right, what does my age matter? You think it's right to stand up for an anarchist? Not at all. I pay no respect to criminals. Then she is not a criminal. The city proposes to teach me how to rule. And the city proposes to teach me how to rule? <laughs> Who is it that's talking like a boy now? My voice is the one voice giving orders in the city. It is no city if it takes orders from one voice. The state is king. Yes. If the state is a desert, this boy, it seems, has sold out to a woman. If you were a woman, my concern is only for you. Your concern in a public brawl with your father. And what about you in a public brawl with justice? With justice when all I do is within my rights. You have no rights to trample in God's right. Fool, adolescent fool, taken in by a woman. You will never see me taken in by anything vital. Every word you say is for her! And for you, and for me, and for the gods under the earth. You will never marry her while she lives. Then she must die. But her death will cause another. Another? Have you lost your senses? Is this an open threat? There is no threat speaking to emptiness. I swear you will regret the superior tone of yours, or you are the empty one. You were not my father. I'd say you were perverse. You girl struck fool, don't play at words with me. Oh, 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 sorry, you prefer silence. My God, I swear, you will watch it. You shall watch it. Bring her out. Bring that woman out. Let her die before his eyes. Right here, this instant, with her break up beside her. No. Not here. She will not die here, King. And you will never see my face again. Go on raving as long as you have friends to enjoy you. Go on. Go on. Play off. When the young man in rage is dangerous, let him do or dream to do what no man can. You cannot save these two girls from death. These girls? You have sentenced them both? No, no, you're right. I, I will not kill the one whose hands are clean. But, Antigone. I will carry her far out into the wilderness and lock her living in a vault of stone. She shall have water and food, as it is the custom. So the state is absolved of her death. And there, let her pray, the gods of hell. They are her only gods, and perhaps they will show her a way to escape death. And she may learn, though late, that piety shown the dead is pity in vain. Love is unconquerable, merciless Aphrodite, waster of rich men and keeper of warm lights across sea and through the woods and Just man's consenting heart. Here you have made anger, but none has conquered but love. None has conquered but love. But I can no 
longer stand in awe of this. No scene would I see. Hold back my tears. Here is Antigone passing on to that chamber where all find sleep at last. Look upon me, friends, and pity me, turning back at the night's edge to say goodbye to the sun that shines for me no longer. Now sleepy death summons me down to Acheron. That cold shore, there is no bright song there, nor any music. Yet not unpraised, not without the kind of honor you walk at last into the underworld. Untouched by sickness. Broken by no sword. What, what woman, woman has ever found your, your way, way to death? How often I have heard the story of Niobe, Tantalos's wretched daughter. How the stone clung fast about her, ivy close, and they say, the rain falls endlessly, and rifting soft snow, her tears are never done. I feel the loneliness of her death in mine. But she was born of heaven. And you are woman. Woman, woman born. born. If her death is yours, a mortal woman's, is this for you not glory in our world and in the world beyond? You laugh at me. Ah, oh, friends, friends, can you not wait until I am dead? Oh, Thebes, oh, men, many charioted in love with fortune. Dear spring of Durst, sacred Theban grove, be my witnesses. Denied, oh, pity, unjustly judged, and think a word of love. For her whose path turns under dark earth where there are no more tears. You have passed beyond human daring and come at last into a place of stone where justice sits. I cannot tell what shape of your father's guilt appears oh. in this. You have touched it at last, that bridal bed unspeakable. Horror of son and mother mingling their crime Infection for all our family. Oh, Oedipus, father and brother, your marriage strikes from the grave to murder mine. I have been a stranger here in my own land. All my life, the blasphemy of my birth has followed me. Reverence is a virtue. But strength lies in established law that must, must prevail. prevail. You, you have, have made, made your, your choice. choice. Your, your death, death is the doing of your conscious hands. Hand. Then let me go. Since all your words are bitter, and the very light of the sun is cold to me, Lead me to my vigil, where I shall have neither love nor lamentation, no song but silence. If dirges and bland lamentation could put out death, <sighs> men would be singing forever. Take her away, go! You know your orders. Take her to the vault and lock her there. And if she dies, that is her affair. Our hands are clean. Oh, too. Vaulted bride bed in eternal rock. Soon I shall be with my own again, where Persephone welcome the thin ghost underground. And I shall see my father again. And you, mother, and dearest Polynices, Dearest indeed to me, since it was my hand that washed him clean and poured the ritual wine. And my reward is death before my time. And yet, as men's hearts know, I have done no wrong. I have not sinned before God, or if I have, I shall know the truth in death. But if the guilt lies upon Crayon, who judged me, then I pray. 
may his punishment equal my own. Oh, passionate heart, unyielding, tormented still by the same winds. Her guard should have good cause to regret mm. their delaying. Your voice you no reason to think, voice of death. I can give you no reason to think you are mistaken. Oh, Thebes. And you, my father's gods and rulers of Thebes, you see me now! The last unhappy daughter of a line of kings, your kings, led away to death. You will remember what things I suffer and at what men's hands, because I would not transgress the laws of heaven. Come. Let us wait no longer. Στην κόψη του ξηραφιού! <laughs> θα μάθεις, θα μάθεις αν ακούσεις τα σημάδια της τέχνης μου. Όπως καθόμουν λοιπόν στην παλιά έδρα του Ινοσκοπίου, όπου εκεί για μένα αράζουν όλα τα πουλιά. Ακούω άγνωστη φωνή πουλιών που έκραζαν με κακή και ακατάληπτη μανία. Ευθύς ξεκίνησα την πυρομαντία σε πάμφλεκτους βωμούς. <laughs> και από τα θύματα δεν έλαβε φωτιά. Πάρα μονάχα στον αέρα πετάγονταν οι χολές και γυμνώνονταν τα κόκαλα. Καθώς έσταζε από τα μεριά το λίπος, τέτοια μάθανα από τούτο το παιδί. Πως οι μαντίες χάνονταν από τις στολές της Ίας. Αυτά παθαίνει η πόλη από τις δικές σου γνώμες. Γιατί οι βομοί και όλες οι σχάρες μας γέμισαν από τα κομμάτια του δύστιχου νεκρού παιδιού του Ιδίποδα, που τους παράξαν τα άγρια πουλιά και σκύλι. Γι' αυτό οι θεοί. Δεν δέχονται πια τις προσευχές και τις θυσίε μας και τα πουλιά δεν βγάζουν καθαρές φωνές γιατί έφαγαν τα χεία μας σκοτωμένου. Σκέψου τα παιδί μου. Είναι κοινό στους ανθρώπους όλους να κάνουν. Σαν μόλις λάθος δεν είναι πια άντρας ασύνετος και απερίσκεπτος. Εκείνος που όταν πέσει στο κακό το διορθώνει και δεν μένει ακίνητος. Η ισχυρό γνωμοσύνη όμως είναι ανοησία. Μα μέρια σας το πεθαμένο. Μην τον κεντάς νεκρό. Για δύναμη να σκοτώνεις ξανά ένα πεθαμένο. Για το καλό σου σκέφτηκα και σου μιλώ ελληνικά. Είναι το πιο ωφέλιμο να μαθαίνει κανείς από εκείνον που κατέχει. Γιατί όφελος διπλό του φέρνει. Όχι. That is why you choose to speak to me in Greek. It seems that prophets have made me their local province. All of my life long I have been a kind of a butt for dolaros of doddering fortune tellers. No, Tiresias, if your birds, if the great eagles of God himself should carry and stink it bit by bit to heaven, I will not yield. I am not afraid of pollution. No man can defile the gods. So you do what you will. Go into business, make money, speculate in that engine gold of the synthetic one from Sardin. Get rich otherwise than by my consent to bury him. Ah, Tiresias. It is a sad thing when wise men sell out. 
letting out their words for hire. Λίμωνο, λίμωνο! Το σκέφτεται άραγε καλά ένας άνθρωπος. Πόσο το πιο όμορφο από τα γαθά είναι η φρόνηση. Εσύ όμως από τούτη την ασθένεια δεν είσαι γεμάτος. Και το κάνεις λέγοντας πως μαντεύω ψεύτικες μανίες. Οι τύρανοι αγαπούν την εσχροκέρδια. Το ξέρω γιατί από εμένα έσωσες αυτήν εδώ την πόλη. Θα με αναγκάσεις τώρα να σου πω αυτά που κρατώ μες την ψυχή μου. Με νομίζεις πια κερνοσκόπο, ε. Αυτή είναι η γνώμη σου. Μα θέ λοιπόν καλά πως δεν θα ζήσεις πολλές γρήγορες τροχές του ήλιου και ο ίδιος θα έχεις δώσει από τα παιδιά σου έναν πεθαμένο για αντάλλαγμα νεκρών. Τον έναν από εδώ πάνω κάτω τον έβαλες και τη ζωή του άτιμα έκλεισε σε τάφο και τον άλλο τον κρατάς εδώ, στερημένο τους κάτω θεούς, τα νεκρικά δώρα, ατιμασμένο νεκρό, αυτά. Δεν σου ανήκουν. Δεν ανήκουν ούτε στους θεούς του πανοκόσμου. Είναι η δική σου βία. Γι' αυτό οι γερημίες του Άδη και των Θεών δεν ξολοθρεύουν, που χτυπούν μετά το έγκλημα, σε παραμονεύουν να πιαστεί σε συμφορές όμοιες με τις άλλες. Και κοίτα με. Δες με αν σου τα λέω πληρωμένος, γιατί θα φανούν. Δεν θα περάσει πολύς χρόνος. Κλάματα ανδρών. Γυναικών στο σπίτι σου και πέφτουν σε εμφύλιες μάχες όλες οι πόλεις που τα σπαραγμένα μέλη τους οι σκύλοι τα τίμησαν, η θηρία ή κάποιο αγριόπολη φέρνοντας την ανώσια οσμή στην Ακρόπολη με τους ναούς και τους βωμούς της τέτοια μέλη σαν το τοξότη πίναξα πάνω στην καρδιά σου από το θυμό μου σίγουρα ε, δεν θα αργήσεις να πιαστείς τη φωτιά τους. Έλα, παιδί μου. Πήγαινε με πια στο σπίτι. Για να μάθει να τρέφει γλώσσα πιο ησυχή. Ονόμες πιο καλές από αυτές που τώρα έχει. The old man has left us, king. But his words remain to plague us. I am old too, but I cannot remember a time that he was ever false. That is true, it troubles me. It is, it is hard to deny the heart, but it is worse, there is everything for stubborn pride. Colonel, take my advice. What shall I do? Go quickly, free Antigone from her vault, and build a tomb for the body of Polynices. You would have me do this? Trion, yes. And it must be done at once, for God moves swiftly to cancel the folly of stubborn men. I start to deny the heart, but I will do it. I will not challenge destiny. And you must go yourself. You cannot leave it to others. I will, I will go. Servants, come, servants, bring access. Come with me to the tomb, I buried her. I will set her free. Oh, my might, my mind is gives. The laws of heaven are mighty, and man must follow him to the last day of his life. Men of the line of Cadmus, you who live near Amphion Citadel, I cannot save any condition of human life. This is fixed. This is clearly good or bad. You, you're Take the case of Crayon. Who can say that a man is still alive when his life's joy fails? Your words hinted sorrow. What is your news? They are dead. And the living are guilty of their death. Who is guilty? Who is dead? Speak. Haman! Haman is dead, and the hand that killed him is his own hand. His father's or his own? His own. Driven mad by the murder that his father had done. But here is our queen, Eurydice. Has she overheard us? I have heard something, friends. As I was opening the door to the palace shrine, for I needed her help today, I've heard a voice telling of some new sorrow, and I fainted there with all my maidens about me. So speak again, whatever it is. 
I can bear it. Grief and I are no strangers. Dearest lady, I will tell you plainly all that I have seen. The truth is always best. I went with Crayon to the outer plains where Polynikes was lying. No friend to pity him, his body shredded by dogs. And we made our prayers in that place to Hecate and Pluto that they would be merciful. And when we are done, we ran to the vault where Antigone lay on her couch of stone, and in the cavern's farthest corner we saw her lying. She had made a noose of her fine linen veil and hanged herself. Beside her lay Haman, his arms about her waist, lamenting her his love lost underground, crying out that his father had taken her away from him. And when Crayon saw this, the tears rushed to his eyes and he called out to him, what have you done, child? Speak to me. But Haman spat in his face. He said not a word, staring, and suddenly drew his sword and lunged. The blade missed. Crayon shrank back. But the boy, desperate against himself, drove it half its length into his own side and fell. And now he lies dead with the dead. And she is his at last, his bride in the houses of the dead. She has left us without a word. What does this mean? It troubles me too. Yet she knows what is best. Her grief was too great for public lamentation. Doubtless she has gone to her chamber to weep for dead son, leading her maidens in his dirge. It may be so, but I fear this deep silence. I will go in. I will see what she is doing. <laughs> but here is the king himself. Oh, look at him, bearing his own damnation in his arms. Nothing you can say. Can't touch me anymore. My own blind heart has brought me from darkness into final darkness. Here you see the father murderer, the murdered son, and all of my civic wisdom. Go my son, so young, so young to die. I was the fool that you and you died for me. That is the truth. But you were late in learning. This truth is high to bear. Surely a god has crushed me under the hugest weight of heaven and driven me along a barbaric way to trample the thing I have most dear. Oh, the pains that men will take shall come to pain. The burden you carry in your hands is great, but it is not all. There is more in your house.
What burden worse than this shall I find there? The queen is dead. Oh, port of death. Deaf world is there no pity for me. And you, angel of evil, your words were death. And now they bring death again. Is it true? Can it be true? Is my wife dead? tradition, and it's probably, hopefully, mentioned in the programs, um, we usually have a Q&A for after this, and um, so the floor is open if you want to have, if you have questions for any of us, uh, we're here to answer them. 
Okay. Oh, say yes, please. Creo, Creo should be the title of the book. Go to Creo. Yeah. Suffer the most. <laughs> Same thing. She said as we were uh, doing through the rehearsals. Yes. Creon has a lot of lines. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, cause it, it, we had a, the, the luck, thanks to Flavius Goifo, to have an interview, um, the main actors, and one of the questions was about Creon. And my goal is uh, that if the audience feels for Creon by the end, then I might have done something right. Because it's the moral law versus the natural law. And there is an expression in the United States that I don't have in Italian, but it's beautiful because some people just don't know better. And that is, at times, what has happened. If they've been through their whole life like that, and now they are at this age, then it's practically impossible to go back. And so they become victim of their own life choices. Congratulations, Tiresias. One moment, please. One moment. One moment. For giving us a reason to go back to read and find out what she said in Greek. <laughs> it's, it's written on the, the program. I know. Oh. <laughs> but congratulations. Can you stop? And all of you, by the way. All of you. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's this question in the back. Based on a true story in real life, was it? Oh. <laughs> I would not know. It was written in 400 before Christ, so. Uh, so uh, the thing back then, Sophocles wrote these three, uh, this, this trilogy, and uh, he was a very political writer. Um, it is likely that there might have been at some point. He was also he had to also be very careful in the way he wrote. Uh, there, I'm sure that there had been, at some point, a king or events that unraveled because mainly every type of myth was written to explain something that we would had no explanation for or to tell a story in such a way that it would not happen again. Um, and so did Shakespeare would like Othello for one, for one. So I would say yes. I personally hope it was inspired by true things. So it's a bit more... It feels very real, if, I mean, and of course, the current situations and yeah, the, yeah, the politics, but yeah, I think so. And, and uh, when the prophet told the king, uh, when she was speaking Greek, mm -hmm. in essence, all it was is that if he, if he didn't release the girl and forgive the son and, and the other girl, then the yeah. gods or heaven would curse him or strike oh, yeah, down? Exa exactly that. Curse the house of Creon and everybody will die except for him. We'll have to endure the death of his whole family. In short. And that's why someone at the end had to knock some sense into him. We were <laughs> holding our tongues the whole time and finally it's yeah. like, alright, well you see, you know, someone had to come in, a blind guy had to come in and tell you like what's what. So that was like the final push to get Creon to do what he needed to do. Karagos mm -hmm. is supposedly older than Creon, by the way. In the ancient world, the Greeks, the Romans, the Jews, women were second-class citizens usually. You know, they were not respected. You know, they were only in the home taking care of children and cooking. But in this case, the prophet was a woman in this, in, in this play? Well, uh, we, we played with the, uh, it's technically they are like, the, the, all the chorus is all old men. And so is Tiresias. We simply wanted to play with the, well, I think I wanted to play with the idea of uh, having the gender swap, but not to make the character female, but to make the fact, to make it so that it does not have to be a man right. to play that character, much like the Shakespeare men and women swapping at times. Can I say something? Please. Tiresias was supposed to have been a woman, and he is supposed to be you know, something like in between. In between, uh, not that exactly. Not, not precisely that one, but yes. Yeah, but Oracle Adelphi was in Shiva. Delphi? Yeah. Apollo's Oracle. Right. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. Cool. The secretary was the one who transcribed. Describe, yes, yes. We're also supposed to have a, I mean, 
the, the, the idea is that there is also a scribe as the whole play happens in one corner, taking notes of everything that goes. So how the characters say the words uh, resonate in that sense because that's recorded history. But you know, we couldn't really King, do that. We have a question. Okay. Yeah. Sarah. King. Uh, one of the great challenges for the American theater is understanding how to deal with the choral loads mm -hmm. in the classics, in the Greeks. And I was really struck by the wonderful solution that you found in making them so active and yet also, and so real as characters, but also ritualistic. And I'm curious about the process, uh, perhaps uh, in the direction or in the work of the actors. Was this done by finding this organically? Was it something that the director simply gave to you? Can you, t can you speak about how you came to, to that? Um, yeah, sure, guys. Well, I was there since day one. <laughs> it was a long process, but Aftikia had something in mind, and without forcing us to do anything, she was guiding us. And people came, people left, people came, and we finally formed this group because it was formed organically, and everything we did on stage tonight is everything we wanted to do anyways under her direction. We worked together as a group. Um, I would also say it, it, it developed throughout. In the beginning, I, I think we were talking a lot about if the chorus sides with Antigone or not. Mm -hmm. They're sort of in between, uh, and they're very scared of Crayon once it shows what he's capable of. So it's, it's uh, I think throughout, we, we've discussed it a lot, and, and it, it's been developing, and, and now it, it is, we also talked about that it would be interesting that each member of the chorus was their own person. Mm -hmm. So even though we are one mind, we do not necessarily agree completely. Mm -hmm. For instance, my character is a little bit more soft about love and, and, and whatnot. So, so, so for her, it is very horrible, all this. But at the same time, she struggles with the fact that she thinks uh, a correct state or uh, senate should follow the rules and the laws of the king. So it is this complexity that we are playing with and uh, right. enjoying a lot. And, um, also, just real quick to Leonidas too, he, he um, cause at first you're, you're right, it, there's no other chorus in any other type of theater in the world, you know? So when I came into this, I had no idea how to really do it. I felt disconnected from what was going on I felt like I was just like sitting in the background and then Leonidas said, no, you're a protagonist in this story. You're very much a part of what's going on. You are a reflection of the audience as well. Our reactions are what you would see if there was something going on. You'd be like, what? What is that? Okay, and then we're like looking at each other and we're, and we're, we're like, did you hear that? So it's, it's, it, it keeps it active because it's happening right now. We're not some, you know, something that floats above. We're right there. We're in our in our chairs, these old guys, and, and we're having to deal with these new things coming into our yeah. kingdom. And just to add, so exactly, so we have our own thought process, but what we say is what we think it's right to say. Mm. And sometimes we don't really want to say it, but we know it's right, and that's just the law. We might just follow the law, must follow the law. And that's what it is. There have been many ways of presenting Creon, and your way was that erratic uh, kind of uh, representation. Others prefer to present him like rational, pretend preserving the laws of the land, but. Uh, I liked your presentation. It was very current, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I liked the music, yeah. and uh, all the acting was wonderful. Congratulations, mm -hmm. and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is fascinating how Sophocles understood human nature because 300 years later, 
under Julius Caesar, who became Creon. Julius Caesar had a battle with Pompey in Turkey, the Battle of Pharsalia. And after the battle was a bloody battle, you know, Julius Caesar won the battle. And he asked his, his commanders, you know, where it was a whole massacre. He says, what should we do with the bodies? They're Roman soldiers, remember, just like his. Mm -hmm. Let them be on the fields, eaten by the dogs and the birds. The same thing, 300 years later. So that's an amazing story. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. That as the the, the, the burnt uh, ashes to set the tone. Make it a yeah, make it a ritual. Anyone? Give it to Anyone else? Thank you, for Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.